So just to give an overview of what I want to talk about, um, I want to give a brief overview of our, of our company, um, I guess, um, activities and objectives and our expertise. Uh, really focusing on benthic habitat mapping and how we're using um, backscatter data in particular um, to undertake this type of activity. Um, I'll introduce a couple of basic methodologies for classifying backscatter data, um, give a, an example of, of how these can be applied to a, a recent data set we've collected using one of our Reason systems, and then really flag up some technical issues and considerations. and. Um, really focusing again on, on spatial scale issues, and then um, really give a glimpse where I, I see this going in the future. So McGregor, we're established in um, 1973. Uh, we're based in, in Halifax in Nova Scotia. Uh, it, the company came under new ownership in 2007, and with this came um, exclusive, exclusive access to three um, ice class um, survey vessels. So a lot of our work is focused in, in the Arctic. Um, we specialize in hydrographic, geophysical, and geotechnical services. And we also undertake environmental surveys and environmental effects monitoring. So we have an experienced team of surveyors, geologists, and biologists to draw on. And this is crucial for benthic habitat mapping, where you're really cutting across the various disciplines. Um, <clears throat> um, so we uh, own and operate a comprehensive uh, suite of survey equipment, including uh, multi-channel seismics, sub-bottom profilers, uh, magnetometers, multi-beam, side scan, and single beam systems. What we're seeing here is data from um, our Rezon 7111. We did a, a route survey for an iron ore company, um, charting um, a route survey right through the Hudson Strait and Fox Basin in uncharted waters. Um, we also operate a, a Rezon 8101 um, extended range system and a Rezon 8160. So we have a range of uh, capabilities in terms of our water depth that we can, we can survey in. So moving on to benthic habitat mapping, what, what are we really talking about? Um, well, essentially, it's the use of the high-resolution acoustic data, which gives us complete coverage of the seafloor environment, and how we can integrate that with in situ ground truthing. You always need to, to collect information in terms of the benthic habitats from um, a, a range of um, actual seafloor sampling, that could be in the form of underwater video, um, seafloor photographs, or benthic grab samples to characterize the geology and the, the biological characteristics of an area. And essentially what we're trying to do, the, the ground truth thing doesn't give you complete coverage, but what we can do is integrate it with our acoustic surveys, um, the bathymetry and the backscatter in particular, um, and come up with some kind of spatial representation. So segment the acoustic data in some way that gives you Biologically, a, a biologically relevant map, um, essentially a, a spatial representation of, of seafloor habitat. And there's lots of different ways to integrate the data, and I'm going to talk about some of those examples. But key to that is um, often the, the backscatter, the, the seafloor backscatter return. So multi-beams really become one of the preferred tools for benthic habitat mapping, and it's really because we get um, good information in terms of the, the seafloor um, bathymetric features, which give you information about the geomorphology, which is important for understanding the patterns of the benthic habitats. But concurrently, it also gives you backscatter, and there's been tremendous um, advancement in the last decade um, in terms of processing, post-processing methodologies for the seafloor backscatter return. And what this means, that we can, we can look at the backscatter return, we can infer um, information about the, the nature of the seafloor. Is it hard, is it soft, is it rough, is it smooth? Which can give you a very powerful way of delineating the, the biological features on the seabed. So the backscatter, um, <clears throat> the conventional way of interpreting it, would you, you would generate a mosaic and um, you would go in there and you would, you would basically draw polygons around the different features that you can distinguish. This is the way that a geological seafloor map would be generated. Um, we still do that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that approach, but it's, it's not very objective. If, if you give a backscatter map to a couple of geologists, you'll probably get slightly different interpretations. So really what we've been trying to focus on is more objective ways of classifying that backscatter and using those classified products to generate a benthic habitat map so that the the methodology is more repeatable. And we can divide these tools, I guess, into two broad, um, broad classes. Um, Image-based segmentation, so how can we get in there and segment the seafloor backscatter return based on the actual features that we can pick out from the backscatter image. 
Um, and there are commercially available software packages to do this. And one I'm going to focus on today is um, QTC Swath View. Or we can look at the signal. We can look at the actual backscatter values uh, across the, um, the swath and use that to infer information about the C4 characteristics. Um, and Geocoder, um, which many of you have probably used and are aware of, it's, it's a fairly recent uh, development that's now been commercialized in a number of post-processing software packages such as Caris, Hips and Sips, um, IBS Fledermouse, and HiPack, um, can, can allow, allows us to do that. So I'm gonna show both, both methods. Um, what I don't want this to be is a comparison of the different software tools. It's really looking at the, the pros and cons of each approach. Um, neither is perfect, but when we use them carefully, we can actually generate some very nice um, end products. So just to give a little bit of an overview of the, uh, the theory and the, and the methodology, um, so I'm gonna start with signal-based backscatter classification and really focus on the, the geocoder um, tools that are now available. So geocoder is a signal-based method. Uh, the, the approach was developed by Luciano Fonseca at UNH. And the, the software does two things. First of all, um, to generate a, a nice backscatter mosaic, you have to, to correct for the, the, I guess the, the physics of the way that the sound is scattering on the seafloor. So if you look at the backscatter returns from nadar to your outer beams, the intensity varies. You get a much stronger return at nadar and it tails off as you go across the grazing angles. So to generate a nice backscatter mosaic, you have to correct for this. And Geocoder does an excellent job in terms of producing good backscatter mosaics. But also locked up in, in this signal is information about the nature of the seafloor. So if you look at the angular response curves, as these are called, and you can actually uh, basically model and, and predict certain seafloor characteristics, things like grain size, hardness, and roughness from the actual shape of this um, return. So the angular response curve will look different from a muddy seafloor to a sandy seafloor to a gravelly seafloor. And we can use that in the predictive capability that we can then feed into our benthic habitat maps. In contrast, image-based backscatter classification is looking at the corrected image and trying to pick out features from the backscatter, um, backscatter data. And again, I'm gonna focus on QTC swath view. I just wanna give you a, a rundown of the processing flow for those of you who may not be familiar with how the software works. Essentially, you load in your raw data, and then again, you have to correct for those um, angular range artifacts. So you, this is called image compensation in the software. So essentially what you're doing there, you're correcting for those angular range artifacts so you don't, you don't classify any along track um, striping in, in your data. And then the way that the, the software undertakes the classification is basically um, by sampling um, each survey track. And it does this by patch generation. So you basically um, define the, the patch size, it's um, a, a number of different options available in terms of your along track to across track pixel dimensions. And then for each of these small rectangular patches, a number of, of features, for which are, are, are termed full feature vectors, um, there's 29 in the new version of QTC Swath View, are basically identified for each, each patch. And these can be things like the mean, the median, the standard deviation, the patterns of the pixels within each of those. They're basically metrics that are describing the patterns of the backscatter. Of these 29 features, we can reduce them using principal and components analysis. And um, the three um, resulting values, Q1, Q2, Q3, describe about 90% of the, of, of the backscatter patterns that you're deriving using this approach. And then what you can do, because you have uh, the three values for each um, rectangular patch of seafloor, you can use basically uh, clustering methods so that by plotting the Q values um, in three-dimensional space, you can use um, various techniques to basically define uh, acoustic classes on the seafloor. So in theory, the, the, the rectangular patches that are close together in Q space are more similar in terms of their acoustic characteristics. And you can basically classify it into bottom types or acoustic classes. So I'm gonna show a, a data set. This is um, from a recent survey we conducted using our Reason 8101. And it's to do with mapping um, fish habitat, um, fisheries in oceans Canada, wherever there's a, a, a dis disturbance event, in this case, a, a harbor dredging project, uh, the, 
uh, whoever's doing the, the disturbance has to mitigate those impacts, and this is what we're seeing here. These little white blobs and, and lumps on the seafloor are artificial reefs that have been put in there to compensate for habitat loss elsewhere in this area. Um, and we, we were commissioned to survey this area and basically map, map these um, reefs that have been put in place to uh, compensate for the, for the fish loss of fish habitat. So we look at the, uh, the bathymetry. You can see quite clearly the little piles of rock on the seafloor. This is a fairly shallow site, um, 6 metres to 11 metres. We have some rocky um, habitat in the north and the west of the area. Uh, this is a backscatter mosaic generated in geocoder, and again, it's done a great job um, producing a, a nice, um, clean-looking mosaic. Uh, you can see that the, the higher backscatter returns associated with the, the hard seafloor. What we have here in terms of sediment characteristics is a gravelly substrate um, grading through to um, coarse and, and medium sands. And you can see that the, 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 the acoustic backscatter from the actual reefs that have been deployed pops out quite nicely. So we can look at our image-based and signal-based classification. And I'll start with the image-based. Uh, this is actually uh, a cleaned up um, classification. Um, I'll show you some of the, the, the raw data and some of the issues with the image-based techniques. But again, you can see that it's picked out the, the reef, the, the, the natural rocky reefs in the north and the west, and it's classified them the same as, as the artificial reefs. We do have some along track artifacts, and we don't really see any difference in the um, seafloor class we know there's a gradation here happening in terms of the, the substrate characteristics. Uh, I'll, I'll look, come back and revisit this data set in, in, a, in, a, in, a sh in shortly. Um, here we have the, the signal-based geocoder classification. At first, it looks like it's done a terrible job. But then when you realize the limitations of the angular um, range analysis for predicting the grain size, it saturates at minus 1,5. So anything that's um, gravel and coarser will always be classified as this. This is a limitation in terms of the methodology. And in fact, it's done quite a good job because everything this side is actually coarser than um, minus one um, phi in terms of the grain size. And we're actually picking up differences as we, as we come in here with the, uh, the change in substrates. And I'll talk a little bit now about the, the, the scale and the resolvability of the features with these two different methods. So we've basically here zoomed in on the, on the bottom component of the, of the data set, and we can start looking at some of the features and how the various classifications are working. So we'll start off with the signal-based um, methods, and this is using the angular range analysis within Geocoder. <coughs> basically, the way that the, um, the approach works, it stacks up a number of pings. Um, the default is 30 pings, so uh, essentially what you're going to end up with is um, a bottom prediction port and starboard for each swath, so here we've delineated a single pass of the multi-beam. So we're actually, again, just classifying um, rectangular patches, if you, if you like. So this is a series of 30 pings along track, and you're coming out with a predicted um, sediment or bottom type um, based on the angular range analysis for each of these patches. And we can see that there, there are limitations there. Where you have a heterogeneous seafloor here, where we're going from the, uh, the rocky reef to the sandy substrate, the classification is not going to work that well. Where we have homogeneous patches, here sand, here sediment, we see that it's actually performing as it, as it should do. Um, so here we're getting fairly accurate prediction of the bottom type. Over here, it's falling down simply because there's limitations in what it can predict in terms of the scale of the features that it can resolve. And that's well documented. This was uh, a, a paper we, I published with Luciano before Geocoder was um, commercialized. And, uh, Essentially here, what we're looking at, again, is the patch of analysis for a stack of pings. And we actually have a boundary here between two sediment types, so sediment type 1 and 2. If you actually look at the signal, the actual angular response curve, we, we can see that it, it changes. Uh, and there's a breakpoint here, which coincides with the sediment boundary between those two sediment classes. And effectively, what it's doing, it's picking up the, um, the, the, the angular response curve for sediment type 1, which is this one, and sediment type 2, which is this one, and you're really getting a combination of the two. So it's not surprising that it's falling down and giving a sediment prediction because we've really got two bottom types in there. And that's a limitation of the angular range analysis methodology and something that you need to bear in mind when using the results. So image-based classification, such as QTC swath view, um, 
you're, you're trying to resolve features based on what you can um, detect from those rectangular patches. The patch size, you can dictate, you can determine the size, the spatial scale. Um, <clears throat> one thing that you have to be conscious of though is that if you don't compensate for the angular range analysis in the, in the processing flow, you, you'll also classify artifacts in the data. And you'll often see a long track, a long track striping um, in the data when you classify it using this approach if the image compensation hasn't worked perfectly. And that's um, what we're seeing here. You can see that um, there, there, are, there is an acoustic class popping out that's associated with the long track features which aren't real. And this is basically an artifact of the processing flow. Um, you can clean these out in, term, in, in terms of your interpretation. If you have ground truthing, you can start merging classes back together, which is what I did on the previous image. So you have to use it in a very iterative way. And the choice of the patch dimensions is also very important. You have to have some, some knowledge of your site and the features that you're trying to resolve. So it has to be fit for purpose. What is your end user re requirements? Um, so if you imagine you've got, a, if you choose a small um, patch dimension, uh, you have higher resolvability of, of smaller features on the seafloor from the backscatter. But you also may be more inclined to classify along track artifacts if the compensation doesn't work very well. Choosing a larger patch dimension, you can often overcome a lot of the along, along track issues. You're taking a, a larger analysis window and um, you can smooth a lot of those features out. So the scale and the sediment heterogeneity are very important in both signal and image-based classification. Both have their pros and cons. Both have to be used uh, in a very informed way to generate um, useful products for, for, for end clients. <clears throat> um, and these need to be considered, um, and the processing parameters need to be considered on a site-by-site -site basis um, <clears throat> and select the processing settings based on known information about the site. So what are you trying to resolve? What's the purpose of the end map? And, and how can you um, how can you use it to maximum benefit? The ground truth thing is always crucial, um, especially if you're generating a benthic habitat map. You really need to have a good ground truth thing. One thing that we have found, certainly using uh, um, our Rezon systems, we, we acquire the data either using Quincy or HiPack, and we use a, a whole suite of post-processing software packages depending on the end needs of the client. And we can often run into technical issues uh, moving the data through the downstream processing packages, things like the file formats. Uh, the header information and things like the XTF can sometimes contradict and we often have technical issues and, and do often have to go back to the software manufacturers for fixes. So it can be, can be quite challenging. And it is a field that is still moving incredibly rapidly. So um, you know, staying abreast of, of, of what's evolving is, is, is important. Um, there are a lot of technological developments and uh, a lot of new changes to, to these approaches. And I wanted to finish off really just showing an example of um, you know, where I see um, the future direction, particularly from a benthic habitat mapping um, approach. And th this is something that we've been developing and, and offering to clients. Um, we've termed it the benthoscape approach. It's like mapping landscapes, but we're in the benthic environment. So we're, we're resolving um, seafloor features at the landscape type scale, hence the term benthoscape. And it's really a, a, an automated habitat classification methodology, um, utilizing both the bathymetry and the backscatter together. Um, what we can do is look at examples from the terrestrial realm. How are we classifying terrestrial landscapes from satellite multispectral data? And we can start to use the multibeam data in exactly the same way. We can treat the, the data sets like multispectral bands. And it's proving that the early results are, are very, um, very successful and very promising. So essentially what we can do, we can take our bathymetry data. This is a, a data set that, that we've worked up for um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, it's uh, German Bank and Scallop Fishing Area 29. So there's an active scallop fishery in here. Um, it's a fairly large site, covers about 5,000 square kilometers. But we can take the, the bathymetric data and we, we can also generate um, other derived layers, things like slope, um, curvature, you know, how does the topography change at various spatial scales. Um, aspect, benthic position index, again, is a seafloor convex, concave, flat, sloping. These are all good predictors of um, biological patterns on the seabed. And we can take our backscatter data and we can use these automated routines, whether they're signal-based or image-based, both would work. So we can take our derived backscatter outputs. These could be from geocoder, they could be um, the grain size, hardness, and roughness measures. 
Or in this case, what we've done is we've used the QTC swath view outputs, but rather than come out with a categorical class, we've actually broken out the principal components, um, Q1, Q2, Q3, and gridded them. And again, what we wanted to do here is look at the data, not just classify the backscatter, but combine it with the bathymetry to come out with an objective classification. So we can take our derived bathymetry and backscatter layers that I've just shown, and we can treat them like multispectral bands, push them through um, multispectral classification routines. In this case, it's the software package Idrissi that is used for multispectral image classification. And we can look for natural patterns in the data sets across those layers, both the bathymetry and the backscatter together. So it's analyzing the, uh, the data sets in multidimensional space and really looking for, for natural statistical breaks in the patterns that we can see across those different layers. So we over-segment to a statistical optimum. So here we've got 15 bottom types for this area. As I said, ground truthing is crucial. So the black and white dots here are our ground truthing locations. These are from toad uh, video and C4 photograph surveys that we did. So we've got very good coverage of this area. So in total, we had over 3,000 seafloor images that are georeferenced. And we can then look at the images that we've got from that area, and we can determine what, how many bottom types we have. And these are what I've called benthoscape classes. So we've been fairly modest in terms of what we classify. So we have a reef class. So it's basically anything that's greater than 50% boulders or bedrock, covered in epifaunal organisms. We have a glacial till class that is less than 50% bedrocks or boulders and is a mixture of gravels, cobbles, and sand. And then we have three soft sediment classes, silt and mud class, a silt with bed forms, and a sand with bed forms and, sand, and, and dense sand dollars. Um, we're fairly confident that we've got the spatial coverage of a ground truth thing. We can put each of those 3,000 images into one of these five classes. <coughs> we know where they are. So we can then look at the, basically the relationship between our five in situ classes and our 15 um, segmented classes, and we can start merging them back, back together based on the best fit. And this is what we end up with. So you can see that basically the boundaries that are merged together in the classes, we're collapsing the classes back down so it matches the number of in situ classes. And we can look at the accuracy. We can do a cross tabulation here looking at the, the predicted accuracy of our final five merged classes with our benthoscape classes. And we actually get 71% accuracy. So it's a method that's actually working very, very well. And it's really putting in uh, or providing, a, I guess, a, a biophysical map of the area setting the scene as you, as you would do a terrestrial landscape map. We can take that one step further. We can, in this case, we were interested in um, scallop habitat for the, for the scallop fishery in the area. And again, we can use methods developed for terrestrial remote sensing classification. In this case, um, species distribution modeling. So there's lots of different ways to, to, to use the modeling methods to predict habitat of focal species. And this is based on ecological niche theory. Every organism will have a preferred range of environmental conditions where it thrives. And the density will be dictated, the, the suitability of a habitat will be dictated by the environmental conditions. So again, we can use our multi-beam bathymetry and backscatter to help define the, the ecological niche of the species where we have them from observed in situ ground truth data, and then produce a predicted map of scallop habitat suitability based on that information. So here's our benthoscape map to give it a broad, broad context. Um, we had about five, five to 6,000 scallop observations that we used to actually build the habitat suitability model for the scallop. And this is what I'm showing here. So the red is basically where we're getting predicted high habitat suitability for scallop, grading through to the blue areas which are low suitability for scallop. <clears throat> so you can see that we really, if I flick between those two, we know that the scallop prefer the glacial till, and that's, that's where we're seeing the greatest amount of occurrence. We can validate using, uh, again, scallop observations from the video, and we're getting about 70% accuracy. But the best way to validate this is to see where the fishermen are fishing for scallop. They know better than anybody where the scallops are. And the black rectangles here are the uh, management units that Fisheries and Oceans Canada used to manage the fishery. Um, and this fishery opened 10 years ago, and all the vessels were fitted with vessel monitoring systems. So we know exactly where they've been fishing over that time period. And we can overlay the results. 
And you can see the agreement's quite st striking. Um, we're getting very good predictability of where the scallop habitat is, and it's coinciding with an independent ground truth data set. So I guess the, uh, the take home message is we can, we can do an awful lot with the data. Um, I wanted to finish off just with, again, a, another example of um, bathymetric and backscattered data used, used together for, uh, for mapping a, a dredge. Uh, dredge channel. Again, this is in Sydney Harbour in, in Nova Scotia. You can see the, the dredge scars and the influence that has on the backscatter. But the potential for using the backscatter in bathymetry and the derived products for benthic habitat mapping um, is far-reaching. There's a lot of things we can do. Looking at the terrestrial environment, for examples, and some of the more sophisticated mapping and, and modeling techniques that offer tremendous pr promise. Um, a lot of people to thank. Um, you know, this is very much multidisciplinary science involving um, acousticians, geophysicists, biologists, geologists, um, and geomatics specialists to basically dovetail all this information together. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>